my first time in uh, in Turkey, in Istanbul. Uh, it has been it's been awesome so far. I don't know how all of you guys are so good looking because the food is unbelievable, and I'd be eating a lot of it if I was here. Um, so, as um, a lot of the places that I've been to before where I've talked about this kind of stuff, uh, particularly in HR conferences, I always like to start by a little disclaimer that, look, I'm not a HR professional. I'm traditionally not from a HR background, but I really um, have kind of become fascinated with uh, the use of these types of technologies that are you know, garnering a lot of attention um, in all industries, actually. And uh, that's you know, AI, machine learning, big data. We've heard a lot of these buzzwords today. And what I hope to do for you guys today is actually kind of demystify some of that and help you understand maybe how some other industries and other products that you interface with every single day are using these technologies and have been doing so for, would you believe it or not, you know, more than 10, 15 years in some cases. I then kind of go on to um, you know, talk a little bit about what I'm doing with uh, EF Education First, which is a, a, an education company, one of the world's biggest um, language learning companies in the world. And um, I also uh, start to talk about how uh, education and um, I guess some of the things we do uh, as HR professionals in terms of you know, building cultures, building teams, uh, helping people progress in their careers and also as individuals, uh, some really important work that you guys do and how machine learning and AI and these things could fold into that. So you'll notice if you guys have looked at the agenda that the title of this has slightly changed and it was really through conversation with Arda and Pina and these guys on the Webrazi team giving me a bit of insights into, into really what you guys are looking to hear and it's something that comes up all the time. Is this stuff here to replace us? Do I need to be worried about my job? And I changed the word revolutionize in the program to, to superpower because this is really what I think technology is here to help us do. It's here to help us superpower our abilities as professionals in particular disciplines. So first and foremost, a little bit about me. I definitely didn't expect to see my head that large on the screen, so I apologize uh, for that. Um, you may or may not recognize uh, some of the companies that I've been involved with or worked with before. Um, my background it has been originally in uh, online and digital marketing, um, and uh, then I moved on to some passion projects within music technology and building uh, te technology products for musicians. Um, and more recently, I've sort of started to uh, work on the uh, ed tech side of things, education technology. And I talk, I'll talk to you a little bit about my own journey of discovery of these technologies and really the common thread that throughout my entire career, whether it's been in online marketing or the music industry, we've really been going for the same toolbox of technology. And I think that's really what is quite interesting about um, the, the opportunity for us today. Um, I'm around and you can ask me a question afterwards, but for those of you who use social media, you can hit me on the gram, as they like to say. Um, so first and foremost, uh, as I said, I'm at, I'm at uh, EF Education First. Um, but uh, my first foray into uh, educational technology was um, at the beginning of last year with a company called Cano in London. Um, and what we did at Cano was we created um, essentially what you might see as a toy uh, that any child or anybody can learn to program. So uh, we did this partnership with um, the Harry Potter uh, folks and um, Warner Brothers, which um, allowed us to make a magic wand, essentially, which has a little nine-axis accelerometer. If you don't know what that is, it's the thing that tells you which way up your phone is when you're taking a picture. And um, we put that into this little magic wand. We built an iPhone uh, and an iPad app. And essentially, the, the, the idea is that kids learn how to construct this wand and all of the little electronic components. And then they pair it with this iPad, and then essentially they learn to code their own spells. So they're learning JavaScript whilst they're uh, enjoying this Harry Potter narrative, and it's all a bit of fun. But the key thing here is it's demystifying the technology. What goes inside these things? How do I learn uh, essentially another language at a young age? Prior to that, um, when I was around uh, 16 years old, I was absolutely sure I was going to be the next Dr. Dre, for those of you who know who he is. Uh, I, was, I was super into music, loved it very much, and later on in my career, I managed to fuse these passions and work for a company called Roly, uh, amongst others, where we designed um, musical instruments that helped anybody who's even into music 
just as a passive hobby, uh, learn how to play music, learn how to interact with music through uh, some of the techniques that we've been talking about today. Both of those products are available in all the Apple stores worldwide, so if you have one uh, nearby where you are, please do check them out. But my first real discovery of machine learning and AI and all of these things was when I was on an internship, um, I was on something called the Erasmus program. I don't know if you guys get that over here, but it's where you can travel abroad and uh, work in a company uh, and study uh, in, 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 the, um, in the local community. So I, uh, I went to Stockholm and I worked for a company called Tagmaster. I was 16 years old and I actually had no idea about machine learning. I don't even know if people were using those terms back then. But um, Tagmaster had a relationship with the London Underground. And if any of you have traveled to London, um, in fact, it's not exclusive to London now, we have them everywhere, but you'll notice uh, those boards that tell you how far away the next train is. And essentially what this technology was, was now what we use to enter a building. It was, it was RFID. And so on the side of the London trains in the early 2000s, we would have a, uh, an RFID tag on the side of a train, and as it passed through the tunnels, it would scan along the way, and that's how those boards used to work. There was a computer under this guy's desk in Stockholm, which basically just did the maths of how far away the next train was going to be, what we should show on the board, how to manage the traffic and the flow of traffic. And this essentially is, it got smarter over time because we were able to figure out, okay, if something's you know, a mile away and it's moving at this speed, then we should uh, make sure that this train stops at a certain place. For a person looking at a desk, that's very complicated. For a, for a, a computer, it became easier and easier over time, excuse me. So what is machine learning uh, in, in that scenario, or what do we know it as today? This is not um, a, a deep insight. You can find this on Wikipedia. But the key thing here is really that it's a system that learns from examples. It's really, really simple. Don't get bogged down in all of the technological uh, um, you know, uh, buzzwords and stuff. It's a system that learns from examples. The more you feed it, the more it learns and the smarter decisions it can make and it can help you make. You'll also be a little bit clouded possibly by where this all fits in with artificial intelligence and deep learning and all this other stuff you hear and data, big data. Big data or data is essentially the fuel for all of these technologies. Artificial intelligence some would argue that we haven't quite got there yet. You haven't really cloned a uh, you know, a person, or you haven't really created an, uh, an algorithm or an engine that can do the job a person does. In some places you have, you know, in some places we've got, um, we've got bots that are able to compute things very, very quickly and allow somebody to just operate that. But really we're still quite far away from what some of us would describe as true artificial intelligence. Machine learning, however, is really, really prevalent uh, in, in the world today, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Deep learning is something that's slightly more uh, complicated if you're not familiar with things like neural networks, but if you catch me outside for a coffee or probably a, a whiskey after this, uh, then you'll, um, you'll um, hear a little bit about how that stuff works. Uh, but machine learning is what we're focused on today. So uh, I'm guessing pretty much everybody in this room has used these brands before. Uh, if you haven't, then you know, I don't know where you've been uh, for the last 20 years or so. But, uh, but Amazon, Facebook, Google, Netflix, if you use these services, you are already engaged, you are already an operator of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Spotify, uh, hands up if you use Spotify in the room. A lot of Spotify users. Uh, so Spotify has changed the way that I listen to music. I used to be a playlist junkie. I used to make my own playlist, make my own mixtapes, all that kind of stuff. Now, it's so good at telling me what I should listen to that I just open a playlist, my Discover Weekly, and it plays me this, a whole bunch of songs, many of which I've never heard before, and I love them all. Um, so it's helping me develop my tastes in music. It's responding to my tastes. Amazon, people who bought this also bought this. Netflix, you watched this, so therefore you should watch this because other people like you really enjoy it. That's all the result of a machine learning algorithm, which is trying to observe the behavior of people, how, fast, how much you fast forward in that Netflix TV show, whether you stop after episode two, somebody who also likes the same stuff that you like and where do they go, what, what do they watch next. This is what's informing how it behaves. But 10 years prior to this, uh, more than 10 years, 12 years prior to this, all of these brands, which 
look largely like retail brands, you could argue that um, you know, Expedia and T-Mobile are, are, are technology brands. All of these brands were using machine learning and AI in a far more advanced way 12 years ago. So what were they doing? If there are any marketers in the room, you'll know about behavioral retargeting. It's uh, for us, for the rest of us, uh, you know, this is essentially when you get stalked on YouTube after you've just uh, looked at purchasing something from ASOS and now you're getting the ad over and over and over again wherever you go on the internet. That's behavioral retargeting um, and an industry that I used to work in before the EU cookie law kicked in. Um, so what does this actually look like in practice? So I visited the, uh, the Monday project management tool website once and I regretted it ever since because uh, the very next day I see an ad on YouTube whilst I'm trying to enjoy um, you know, the highlights of Manchester United's uh, horrible game in the Champions League. Um, and then later on I'm just trying to engage in my social circle on Instagram and I'm seeing ads on Instagram. Insane. How is this happening? Well, how it is happening is actually an algorithm that essentially a machine is operating. This is machine learning. So I visit a website, a cookie or a file gets dropped on my machine. That cookie is, might be anonymous, it can't identify me as an individual, but it can identify my behaviors, my trends, um, my IDs, you know, uh, you saw my, my, my social tags at the front, maybe I use social media too much, but it can then find me on another platform and push that thing back to me because there is a, a level of confidence that I'm going to engage in that brand, I'm going to purchase that product. This is what machine learning and artificial intelligence has done. And this is created, by the way, let's not get it twisted here, it's, it's, it's created a hundreds of billions of dollars uh, industry around the world and even so far as you know, governments are trying to regulate this with the cookie laws, as I, as I described. But what relevance does that actually have to learning and human behavior and, and, um, and, and HR? Well, there's a very weird left turn here and a very unlikely source. Uh, I'm, I can't see the entire crowd, but can anybody put their hands up if they recognize this screen? One person, two, three people. Okay, you guys are also losers like me then. That's great. Uh, this is a video game uh, called Football Manager, which um, anybody who's into football like I am and anybody who grew up uh, sort of, uh, you know, late uh, in the 90s and, and, and early noughties, you will probably be playing this. The people who put their hands up look like they're about 40 years old, so I know you've been playing this since the beginning. Um, and this is a really, really interesting use case. I'm showing you, I'm at HR conference right now, and I'm showing you a video game screen. Why? So, Football Manager is a very weird game in that you don't actually play as the football players. It's not like FIFA or, you know, one of those other games. You actually play as the manager, so you have to manage the spreadsheets, do the training program, manage the budget, build a, a tactics, build a culture around your club. Um, and this might sound really, really boring, but actually what happened um, around the time of 2001, 2002 when this game went online, they'd already sold like five million copies or so. They went online and then all of a sudden they've got access to you know, the behaviors of all of their players. What happens is, if I'm playing the game on my computer and those other four people who put their hands up are playing the game on their computer, this player, Marcus Rashford, who is a young prospect at Manchester United today, he will have a different path in each game. In my game, he might stay at Manchester United. Uh, in that gentleman's game at the back, he might have joined Besiktas on loan or Galatasaray. In whatever scenario uh, Marcus Rashford ends up, his attributes, his ability to cope with those circumstances, the, the roaring crowds of the, of the Turkish league versus the fairly passive crowd at Manchester United, because most of them are tourists, to be honest. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the way that the training program is structured, the temperament of the surrounding players and the coaches, the um, expectations of the club, whether you should be winning trophies or just reach profitability as, like a business. All of those factors have data points inside this game. And when you compute all of those data points, especially when people like us have been playing this game for four, five, six, seven, ten seasons, you start to create a behavioral analysis about these individual players and the composition of teams and the success rate of teams. And so, Football Manager today, if, you, if anybody here watches Sky Sports uh, or, or the equivalent here, when it's transfer window time, when players are being traded from one club to another, you'll see that they pull up a statistics sheet. And that statistics sheet 
at the bottom uh, says powered by football manager. A, a video game is powering the same data that coaches are using to purchase players. And if there is a documentary you can find on YouTube, which also gives you the information about uh, a guy named Joe Kinnear, who used to manage a Scottish team. It's a very, very quick story. In this documentary, he said, look, my son, 14 years old, came up to me one day and he said, Dad, Dad, you have to sign this player for, your, for, for Rangers Football Club in Scotland. He's amazing. He becomes World Player of the Year in 15 years from now. And the guy was like, come on, I'm not going to sign this player because my child came up to me and, and told me to sign a football player. Out of interest, he phoned the club. The club was Barcelona. And he said, look, I've heard about this kid. You guys have them in your youth academy. I'm wondering if he can come on loan to, 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 to Rangers for the year. They had literally hung up on the spot. Five or six years later, the player emerged onto the scene and won World Player of the Year numerous times, including this year, and that player was Lionel Messi. So this is the behavioral algorithms, the, the, the machine learning algorithms, the predictive mechanisms doing their work and being able to predict that somebody who is in the game at the time was 15 years old goes on to be one of the best players of all time. So what does that mean to us and how are we able to apply some of those same techniques? So in my geeky way, I have, dis I have kind of like broken this down to something called C2P2, which um, is not to be confused with R2D2 from Star Wars. Um, this is uh, what I call capture, compute, prescribe, and predict. Now remember, I'm not necessarily uh, uh, somebody who's going to sit here and write an algorithm for you, but this is how I understand the technology, and I feel that it's um, a beneficial way of, of breaking it down. So what's happening here is you're, we're actually capturing data at source. In the Football Manager example, it's you know, live games, live data that's happening in real matches. In the marketing example, it's your behavior on a website, how long you hover over an image, how long you uh, read reviews for, whether you put it in your basket or not. All of those things are raw data. You don't know that that is affecting your experience, but it is. Out of that, the algorithm pulls out um, some, some ideas around whether or not you're a candidate to actually purchase this product. That's called computing the data. And then, ultimately, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to prescribe an action, saying you should do more of this, and then you will succeed, or we will succeed. And uh, that is the prediction, knowing how and which direction to put, push them in. But the pink line at the bottom really represents what people like us should be doing. We should be thinking about what is it that we actually want to predict, because machine learning can help us get there. And that's what we want to explore a bit more. For education first, uh, we're a language learning company, and until very recently, um, we never had any data whatsoever around speech, which is ridiculous. Language is heavily about speech, of course, reading, writing, listening as well. So in my job as um, the VP of product innovation there, one of the ideas was to harness the data that we know we have access to. We just are not capturing it in the way we need to. So this data is pronunciation, you know, for people learning a second language, uh, some people, let's say in Turkey, might, might, might uh, struggle with certain phonemes, with certain syllables when they're speaking English. In China, where I'm doing a lot of work, that's, that's very true. And so understanding how they're developing in pronunciation is very important. Um, grammar, reading, all of these things are data points that we can capture. And then where do we capture them? Well, we can capture them in teacher feedback. We can capture them in assessments. We can capture them uh, in something called a personal dictionary, which is an app we've developed. All of those places allow us to capture the data and then compute it against other similar students. And what we end up with, and this is something we're actively doing at Education First, is we end up with something like the football manager example, but actually for students. We, we're able to now profile for the five or six parameters that mean something to us, how students uh, fall on that, on, that, on that structure. And then we can do really, really clever things like pairing up students with each other to help each other where, where there is deficiencies or building classrooms where people are of the same proficiency level, giving teachers access to that information so they can coach one-on-one -on -one better as well. I'm out of time, so I'm going to very quickly go through this. This is something that we're doing for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. We're the official language partner there, and um, they've asked us to uh, help the volunteers communicate with the athletes, communicate with the coaches, and know how to uh, assist, not just in a, the toilet is that way sense, but really help them move, uh, move the needle on um, getting what they want out of the 2020 20 Olympic Park. 
And then this is a, a story which I think just before I end, I want to kind of bring this together to the HR aspect of things. Uh, this is Nick. Nick was a guy who came, um, it's the best picture I could find of him. Nick was a guy that came into a, a hackathon that we had in our organization. Um, we were recruiting for a developer. This Nick was 18 years old, nine, just turned 19. He came, he had dropped out of uh, college, didn't really want to go to university, but he just studied, he just did software engineering on his own in his bedroom. So we put him into this hackathon, and all of the developers were saying, this guy is absolutely killing it, you know, we have to hire him. And at that time, we still were looking for CVs, we're looking for qualifications, where's your degree, what did you study? What we ended up with was, we gave him a test, and he passed the test with flying colors. We put him in on, on an internship program, and within 18 months, Nick became the head of DevOps in uh, Affiliate Window, which is a company uh, that does online marketing, which was later acquired by Axel Springer, one of the biggest conglomerates in the world. Today, Nick is 29 years old, or 28 years old, and working as the VP of DevOps for Axel Springer, a company of something like 60 or 70,000 people. How can we do that? How can we use the tools like machine learning and artificial intelligence to help us achieve that within our own organizations? How can we predict that? My friend Cassie at Google talks about how machine learning can help us cultivate leadership and really build out um, strong leaders, identify talents early, help us develop those talents internally, give them opportunities, and, uh, and, and find the right source you know, when it comes to uh, team building. Some of the things that are happening in the HR world already are on the screen. You know, we've got machine learning and AI being used for attracting talent, which is an obvious one. And one that's super interesting to me is attrition detection. A lot of people, Neeraj and, and a couple of the other speakers talked about the fact that people have their own networks now. So f at first, they're reaching out to those guys saying, hey, look, I've got this problem at work. Can you help me? Then it turns into, hey, look, we've got an opportunity for you. Do you want to come and work for us? How do we sense those things early? How do we predict and then prescribe actions to our managers to say, keep this talent inside because if you keep them here and we can build a team around them long term, it's going to be more successful for us. In the future, there's a lot more to come. And when I say future, I'm literally talking from 2020 onwards. People are going to start using this stuff to really build out teams in the same way we saw in the football example. Um, the redistribution of talent, just because somebody is the expert in one particular thing doesn't mean they should be the manager in that. They could be a great team player and help a, a young team really come up through the ranks if you put them in, a, in, a, in another smaller team. This kind of stuff can be predicted by AI and machine learning, and these are some brands that are already pushing these kinds of products out if you're not familiar with them. So what is it that you want to predict about the future of your company, your team, individuals? HR, what are the capture points that you guys can leverage? And really think deeply about that. It could be something as, similar, as small as an NPS survey that you actually start really computing the data on and don't care about the NPS score because that's not the important part, honestly. Um, start to pay attention to the data. And let's get learning. Thank you very much.